Hello again, Design Spark. Today we're going to be talking about the world of data science and how, in tandem with engineering, these can combine to make impactful statements around environmental issues. Just recently, world leaders came together at COP26 in Glasgow to discuss global warming and climate change. Actions were agreed to be taken by individual nations, but for some, these changes do not go deep enough and they are too little, too late. So what role does the engineer have in all of this? You may have heard the term activist engineering or activist engineer. This is where engineers can use this data and also their skills around technology to make impactful statements, but also look at what may need to happen in the future and potentially provide solutions for this. So with this in mind, I'd like to welcome Jody Barnsley, a data scientist to Design Spark for today's call. Hi Jody, welcome to Design Spark. Would you like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of a background about data science and your activities? Yep, so I'm Jody Barnsley. I'm from the UK and I completed my master's in maths and computer science in uh, sort of summer of 2020, um, where I focused my master's thesis on looking at outdoor air quality and how we can use mathematical modeling and historical data to provide predictions and real-time data to people that suffer with sort of lung-related illnesses and things. So there was always um, a theme of health care-related projects through my uni work and, uh, and it sort of come to a head for that project and it's something that I'm really interested in um, I currently work for a healthcare solutions company as a as my sort of day job. I'm involved in this project. I'm involved in a couple of other things um, that look at other air quality, but I think we'll uh, we'll touch on that later. Great, fantastic. So let's go right back to the start. So Jody, can you just explain to me what data science science is and why that is important? Yeah. So data science is essentially just looking at big amounts of data and trying to find you know what's hidden in there um, we're looking for trends and patterns and things that can help inform us of how situations like that might end or or how they might progress if they were to happen again so I think it's important because we live in a world where we're surrounded by data or or things that collect data and we're, we're moving closer and closer to a to a world where everything will have the capability to collect some some kind of yeah. data and there's so much knowledge and insight in there if you know where to look and what to look at that um why wouldn't we um and then when it comes to sort of yeah air quality for me um that's what i find really really interesting okay so you were talking about um, just in your introduction there about what you've you done at university. So your thesis focused on outdoor air quality and predictive modelling. So this was to help people who were vulnerable to poor air quality. Where would you start on that type of journey? What, what structure would you need? You mentioned about retrieving historical data. Do you use that and apply current data to create new modelling? Yeah, so pretty much. Um, obviously, it was a thesis, so there was quite a lot of research and planning that went into it. But essentially, yeah, we uh, we agreed on a data source. So I used the uh, the UK government department, DEFRA's air sensor network, which runs the, the length of the whole country. And we took um, the historical data from there and also regularly got the, 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 like the live data. Uh, I had that cleansed, formatted, stored, and then performed some analysis on that, which, yes, yeah, sort of provided me with a with a predictive model and allowed me to forecast. Um, right. So, just recently, I see I've seen a graph that goes back to like um, the 1500s, where they're measuring the the air temperature, and around 1850, you can see where the impact of uh, what's been in terms of the the industrialization of the world has actually made a magnitude of change a lot greater than, than what it was. So we were kind of on a linear path in terms of the way the planet's eaten up. And quite clearly, clearly over the last, say, 200 years, we're now seeing that there's a big swing into the, the rate of change. So just in terms of taking this back to air quality projects, what are the best um, practices for data collection 
So if somebody was interested in a, doing a, this type of um, project, what, what advice would you give to those people? So I think um, sample frequently, but maybe don't be too overzealous, which I think ties in with my bigger piece of advice or best practice, which is try and be very realistic about what your sensors are capable of or what your data source is capable of um, and realistic about the length of time. So for me, all the interesting stuff lies in the seasonality and the trends, the patterns and uncovering, you know, the secrets of, of the data. And you only get that, you know, really interesting stuff from, from lots of data. And so if you're, if you're looking for, for trends over time, don't underestimate how long that's going to take. Yeah, that, that, that's quite a good point, actually, because that leads me on to this next question. And part of the reason why I was talking about the earth heating up was, if I'd have looked at that graph in isolation at very specific parts, I wouldn't have seen any trends at all until we got to the end. And if I only looked at the end of that graph from 1850 onwards, the trend itself wasn't that, that great. It was only when we look back further in time that you notice that there's a big change in here. So in terms of data, I think people, um, you know, they, they can be uh, maybe fooled by by figures, for example. What what about visualization of data? What, what would you, you suggest, you know, for making comparisons for visualization? Because I think that paints quite a, a strong picture. Yeah, visualizing um, science stuff can always be quite tricky especially if you don't quite know your, what your audience knows about the subject matter. Not a lot of people know a lot about air quality. Um, and so it can be really hard to, to visualize it in a way that keeps people interested and, and that lets people sort of digest it really easily. And like you say, when you look at graphs, for example, you can very easily take those out of context or completely miss like the wider picture. So I think, you know any visualization that helps people understand the magnitude the size so with air quality we're talking about parts per billion things within things that are really small and we're bad at that right we we struggle with with really small numbers yeah. and really big numbers and so anything that helps people understand how small but also the impact that those small numbers can have on us um, that's where the the sweet spot is. Right. That's yeah. That's a really good point. If, if it's so small, people think, oh, is that an issue? But in terms of <laughs> the cause and effect, it could be a potential issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just on, you know, if I'm thinking about, you know, electronics design or circuit analysis from that point of view, um, when I'm looking at data, the sampling rate is important. You know, if it's too low or too high, I get very different outcomes. So. Would this be the same for things like environmental measuring, particularly around air quality? But within circuit design, there are other things that you need to take into consideration. And, and would that be the kind of same when you're measuring for air quality? Things like wind speed, air pressure, temperatures, do they all need to be factored in as well? Yeah, so sampling always depends on, on what you're trying to investigate or look at, right? So outdoor air pollution and air quality um, are, of, of course, blown around by by the wind and stuff and so if that's what you're you're looking at the movement of particles or or how they're distributed or whatever then then yeah sure but you know sort of temperature and humidity affect wind as well right and then the increase in wind and you're moving your particles around more so probably a bit more variance in in readings but then on the flip side you know those things don't really affect indoor air quality and so that might be subject to other influences like materials in the room that might absorb certain yeah. pollutants or you know if the room has a has a HVAC or or air conditioning or whatever. Yeah that, that actually is a nice uh, segue into my next question so we're asking our Design Spark community to focus on air quality but we'd like to know your advice you know for data modeling when it comes to creating air quality projects but you mentioned indoor and outdoor projects how would they they differ so if we were looking at outdoor what do we need to consider against indoor obviously you're, you're talking the environment within each is different and you may yeah. want to change indoor air as much as you want to improve outdoor air yeah so pollutant levels for outdoor are, are much higher than indoor as you as you might imagine 
Um, and so again, I think like sort of some of that comes back to being realistic about what your sensors can measure or what, what network you're using or for example. But um, modeling is just about finding a pattern. So, you know, no model, no, pa no pattern, no model. Um, and I think sometimes uh, you have to really think outside the box. So try and um, remember what you're focusing on and try and, and, and yeah, think about how, how else that might be interpreted. Indoor air quality, you know, like I say, can be affected by, by things that, that you might never even consider, like a sofa, you know, sort of um, absorbing a certain pollutant or uh, not having a induction, um, uh, whatever you call the things that go above the grill. Yeah. Um, like not having one of those in a small kitchen, for example, like it's a, it's really small things, um, but they, they have a big impact on the data. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you on the, uh, the filter over the cooker, because I know when my daughter cooks, it's uh, the kitchen is no go zone. Uh, do, not, <laughs> do not go in there. So I'm with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> So, Jody, just on a more uh, personal point of view for yourself, for, for example, you highlight that you're working with with in the medical industry. So in terms of what you're currently working with, are there any innovations that you would be able to to share with us or or any other projects that you're working on? Obviously, you're helping the alphas on the Design Spark project, but yeah. anything else that you'd like to just share with us? Um, yeah, so um, I can't go into too much detail, but I am involved in, a, like I mentioned earlier, an indoor air quality project, which is looking at um, sort of sensors for busy office buildings or possibly like schools, um, you know, things where people are moving around a lot throughout the day. And we're sort of looking at um, exposure uh, to different pollutants over time rather than just what the current readings are so that's been really interesting as well and um, which has also given me an opportunity to compare indoor and outdoor which is something that I haven't been had the like sort of the chance to do as obviously yes yeah, sort of thesis focused on uh, on outdoor and that's been that's been also really interesting um looking at, at possibly matching trends or if we can see if outdoor pollution influences indoor pollution at all Okay, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, because you think sometimes opening the window, you're going to be getting fresh air. <laughs> Not essentially true all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Jody, just just to finish, um, I did mention the term activist engineer earlier on in the discussion. So what, what scope do you see for engineers and people like yourself, data scientists, to become more ingrained, particularly when we're looking at environmental issues and solutions? Yeah. So... I think the idea of activist engineering is great. And I think that, like, as we, as I said earlier, as we sort of progress into this world where everything is IoT, everything's connected, connect, collecting data, or, or, or like I say, definitely capable of it. Um, if, if those mechanisms and systems can be used to bring about like positive change and help solutionize in like new ways, I, I think that's really awesome. And I think, um, you know, I, again, sort of passion for healthcare and the environment and, and making positive change. And, uh, and if we can, if we can utilize this, um, then why not? Fantastic. Jody, it's been great talking to you today and find out a little bit more about the importance of data. Um, but then also, how can that be used to help to influ influence others? And I think one of the main things is about creating the awareness of environmental issues. So, I really like to thank you for taking the time to talk to Design Spark. I'm pretty sure that we could have loads more to talk about. It's such a big subject, but thanks for uh, joining us today and hopefully we can talk again real soon. Yeah, well, thank you for having me.